I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to our Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations program. How migratory creatures, especially birds, navigate over vast distances has been a research issue for decades, but there are still many unknowns. Our guest today has been an international leader in that research, and he's about to explain what scientists know about the uh, sensory maps of birds and other migratory creatures. Charles Walcott is Professor Emeritus at Cornell University. He served there as Director of the Ornithology Lab, then Director of the Division of Biological Science and other positions for that university. Dr. Walcott has worked with PBS Nova and has been featured in several Nova productions. Dr. Walcott, a big welcome, and thank you very much for joining us today. Well, it's a great pleasure to join you today. <laughs> and the topic I'm going to talk about is that of bird migration. And here in Ithaca, New York, our hummingbirds have left uh, for the south, and we see birds flying over on their, on their journey uh, down south. And uh, what I think perhaps one doesn't realize is what an extraordinary journey it is. This bird that I'm showing you here is an Arctic tern. It nests up along the coasts of New England up into Canada. And then in the fall, it flies uh, down uh, an extraordinary journey uh, down along the coast of Africa sometimes or down the middle of the ocean and spends the winter flying around in Antarctica. I used to say that the birds flew on the order of uh, 12,000 miles a year. It turns out I was totally wrong. Uh, they fly on the average 48,000 miles uh, in the course of a year. And this is really quite an extraordinary journey. Another example is this, which is a bar-tailed godwit. And the bar-tailed godwit nests in Alaska and then uh, migrates nonstop from Alaska down to New Zealand, an extraordinary trip of something like 11,700 kilometers uh, over the open ocean uh, to reach New Zealand. And then coming back in the spring is even more interesting. It doesn't do it in one uh, journey. It flies uh, first about 10,000 kilometers to China, spends some time in China refueling in the marshes and so on, eating, and then it flies another 6,500 kilometers uh, over to Alaska. And to me, that is an extraordinary uh, kind of journey. But that's not even the most extraordinary. This is a field in North Haven, Maine, actually, it's the field that Charles Lindbergh used to land his airplane in uh, when he went to see his uh, wife's family. And if you look at this field, it's full of milkweed. And the milkweed, if you look at that, has these caterpillars. And these are the caterpillars of a monarch butterfly. And the monarch butterfly is also a migratory species. Uh, these caterpillars turn into a pupa and then uh, into this lovely adult uh, butterfly here feeding on the milkweed. In the fall, these butterflies take off and they fly uh, down to Mexico, where they spend the winter in a huge flock uh, nestled on uh, particular kinds of trees in a particular area. And here's a great cluster of them, uh, is how they overwinter. And then in the spring, they fly back up north. And the butterflies we have in Maine are probably four generations removed uh, from those in Mexico. They started down there in Mexico. They moved up into Texas. They stop, had a brood. The uh, corresponding adults fly further north and so on until finally uh, they make it all the way up uh, to Maine where they have probably one, maybe two broods uh, before they head back down uh, to spend the winter in Mexico. Uh, but it isn't just 
birds and butterflies. Uh, it's salmon that spend their years out in the Pacific Ocean and then return to the exact same gravel bed where they themselves were hatched. Or it's the sea turtle who was captured from somewhere over towards Japan, uh, taken over to Mexico and released. And here is the track of three of those turtles uh, making their way back uh, towards uh, Japan. And uh, you see that some of them actually made it uh, uh, all the way uh, across the Pacific Ocean. And there are migra migrating uh, caribou. Lots of uh, mammals migrate, particularly in Africa, but caribou in, in this country. So the main example I want to talk about today is that of the migrating birds. And they move in enormous flocks, uh, in, usually at night, uh, from their breeding grounds uh, down to spend the winter somewhere where it's warmer and where there will be lots of food uh, available to them. The question, of course, is how do these birds find their way? And the first question uh, was resolved by a fellow named Gustav Kramer many years ago, who put starlings in kind of a circular cage like this. And on the left-hand side, you can see the spots the birds learned where to find food in this circular cage. Uh, and it was relative to the sun. And then what he did was to put little mirrors. If you look on the right-hand diagram, all those flaps have little mirrors so that the image of the sun is deflected by about 90 degrees. And the result of that is that this bird, which in this case was a starling, was also deflected by 90 degrees. It turns out that the sun is a very important compass for lots of animals. Honeybees use it, birds use it, uh, insects of various sort use it, and it's by far the most common uh, compass. But I just told you that birds migrate at night. If they migrate at night, they can't see the sun. So what on earth are they using? It turns out that what they're doing is using the stars. And this was shown by one of Kramer's students, a uh, fellow uh, by uh, uh, the name of Hans Sauer, who found that his migratory birds that he was working on are active during the night. They're hopping about in their cage. He found that if he laid underneath the cage, he could see the birds silhouetted against the sky. And he noticed that they spent most of their time in the appropriate migratory direction. That is south in the fall and north in the spring. Uh, but the problem is he can only do two at a time. That is Mr. Sauer and Mrs. Sauer. And that was uh, meant it was very hard to get a great deal of data. It was therefore uh, a fellow by the name of John Emlin and his son, Steve Emlin. Uh, John was, uh, I think, at the University of, uh, oh my gosh, Wisconsin. And Steve was here at Cornell, developed what is now called the Emlin funnel. And it really is very simple. It's a two-quart fake tin uh, with a funnel made of blotting paper and a screen on top so that the birds can't escape. And then the tricky part, there's an ink pad down at the bottom. And so the bird stands on that pad and with a little inky feet. And then when it begins to flutter, uh, it makes little inky footprints on the side of the blotting paper. And in that way, you can do uh, many birds at once. And here's a red start who is uh, been in the funnel, and you can see that it's quite clear what direction uh, that bird uh, was headed. Now, that enables Steve Emlin uh, to set up a number of these things. Uh, he used a bird called an indigo bunting, and the indigo bunting is a short-distance migrant. Uh, it 
Um, come on. It uh, breeds in the area uh, north up uh, to Massachusetts and New York and so on. And then it winters down in Central America. And so what he did was to put his indigo buntings in emlyn funnels, and he found a local planetarium here at a local school, and uh, he was able to put the emlyn funnels, as you can see here, in the planetarium, and then he was able uh, to show that they were well-oriented in the appropriate direction. And the way of summarizing that kind of data is uh, and there's the bird in the in the funnel, uh, leave the, and then to go bunting, leaving the little inky footprints. And here are the, is the result. On the left is the planetarium sky under normal conditions. This was in the fall. This was in the spring, so the birds were headed north. And you can see that the arrow indicates the average direction the birds were choosing, which was directionally north. And there were, of course, always a few that didn't get the message and head in the wrong direction. But the majority were well headed uh, north. Now, in the planetarium, one of the things you can do is turn it around so that you can change the star pattern uh, and put the North Star south. And if you do that, it turns out that the birds also mm -hmm. turn around and aim in the wrong direction. And then, if you simply turn off the stars, you see the pattern on the third one, the one on the right, which is essentially random. Those birds have the clue uh, what direction uh, they're going in. And so Emlyn concluded that what was going on here uh, was that the birds uh, were using the stars, the star patterns, <clears throat> in the in the uh, in their migration, and uh, that was a very exciting finding. However, there are days here in Ithaca when the sun does not shine and the uh, evening sky is covered with clouds. And what could the birds do then? And so we've got to switch now to Germany and the work of. Uh, Vilschko uh, and his uh, wife, who worked in the basement of the Frankfurt Natural History Museum, and they used European robins, and they put them in a cage, a circular cage, uh, like this, and uh, the robins were reasonably well oriented, and they were then able to change the magnetic field around this cage and show that the robins by and large changed their migratory direction depending upon the Earth's magnetic field. So it looks then as if we have essentially uh, three methods of orientation. There's the sun by day uh, as a sun compass. There is the stars at night and then third, uh, there is the use of the Earth's magnetic field. And, uh, uh, but none of those things, one can imagine, they're all compass directions. That is, they give you a direction. But supposing you found yourself in a small boat out in the middle of the ocean somewhere, you see no land in any direction, and you have a compass with you, does that really help you? No, it doesn't, because you don't know what direction you need to go. You don't know the direction to home. And it's that problem, which we call the map problem. It isn't that they have a Rand McNally map. They just have some way animals do of having, figuring out uh, the direction it is uh, towards home. And one of the more interesting experiments was uh, conducted by some people at Princeton uh, University in Princeton, New Jersey. They captured white-crowned sparrows out in Sunnyside, Washington, 
these sparrows uh, breed north of there. Uh, so they were on their migratory journey south uh, to where they spend the winter, which is down towards Baja, California, and, and Mexico there. And uh, these birds were in migratory condition. They then moved them to Princeton, New Jersey. And the question was, what direction uh, were they going to go at Princeton? The first possibility was they were going to continue south in the direction that would have gotten them home uh, from Sunnyside, Washington. A second is uh, that they might go back the way they were captured, uh, that is, back to Sunnyside, Washington. Or the uh, other alternative is that they might head directly from Princeton, New Jersey, uh, to their wintering ground. What they did was to follow them in an airplane uh, to see exactly what they did. They equipped them with little radio transmitters, followed them in the airplane, and what they found was very interesting. At the top, you'll see uh, the path that these birds took, and it mostly was towards uh, the wintering ground. There was one, of course, who headed off uh, down kind of south, uh, hit the coast, and then decided that wasn't at all the right thing to do, and suddenly turned and headed uh, direct uh, for uh, the wintering ground. Now, these were adult experienced uh, sparrows. The young of the year, that is the birds that had never made this trip before, behaved very differently. They, in fact, headed south. And here's the tracks of those uh, first year uh, young birds. They headed in the direction that had they been left in Washington, would have taken them down to their wintering ground. And they didn't know any better to compensate and uh, fly uh, in the appropriate uh, direction. So it turns out that migration may well be a learned response in birds and that the young birds of the year are not as good at compensating for being blown off course as are the adults. So we can summarize that in a diagram. And here it is. Uh, the adults you can see are the uh, kind of uh, blue arrows on the left. They are headed uh, back to the wintering ground and the juveniles are headed close to uh, due south and uh, they are having, having trouble. It turns out there are ways of studying uh, the migration of birds uh, which are really uh, interesting. Uh, during the Second World War, it was found uh, in Britain uh, that the radar was occasionally able to pick up birds. Uh, in the Second World War, they, uh, when there was an air raid, they housed biologists and physicists in the same bunker uh, and spread them out so that if a bunker got hit, it wasn't didn't kill off all the physicists or all the biologists. And one of the biologists was talking to a, a radar expert who said that he noticed that in London, uh, there were these uh, targets that appeared first thing in the morning as a series of circles around London. And then they moved out into the countryside and dispersed. And in the evening, the process was reversed. And it turned out uh, that the biologist pointed out that this was starlings who were spending the uh, evening in the city where it was warm and nice, and then going out to forage in the countryside. In this country, there's a Spandar radar down on Wallops Island, Virginia, which was used to track uh, expeditions to the moon and so on. And it turned out, we asked them if they ever saw birds. They said, well, no, birds don't reflect enough energy to be really seen very well. And then we looked at the radar screen and we could see occasional targets moving slowly. And then they uh, took us over to a place where you could sit in the comfort and you had a telescope that was 
uh, slaved uh, to the radar, and we picked up one of those targets. And in a little while, what should we see but a good old goose flying along ever so slowly, at which the radar people confessed that, yes, it must be that radar uh, was able uh, to uh, see birds in, in migration. And it turns out that nowadays, the lab of ornithology has a major project using weather radars to monitor bird migration across the whole of the United States. And if one goes to the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology website, one can see pictures of this enormous uh, migration. I took a different uh, view, uh, and this is a picture of a radar. This shows uh, the migration, and you can see that it's moving kind of north-south. You can't tell what direction the birds are moving, uh, but they're moving kind of north uh, north and, and south. I took a different point of view. I wanted to use a bird uh, that I knew where it would come and it would do this at all seasons. And this is a homing pigeon. Uh, it lives in a, a loft and you can take it up to a thousand miles away and a place it's never been before. Let it go uh, and it will find its way uh, home. Uh, you first do some training, and here I am releasing a bunch of pigeons on a training release, and uh, uh, that uh, they then uh, will come home. And what we learned about the pigeons is that they use the sun as a compass because they mostly fly during the day. They're able to compensate for the movement of the sun through the sky, so they have an internal clock. Uh, they are able uh, to uh, use, when the sky is overcast, they are able to use a magnetic compass, just like the migratory birds. But what they use to figure out where home is, is still almost completely mysterious. The Italians believe that they are using odors, uh, that, the pigeon, that the pigeons learn that the wind from the north brings the smell of the garlic fields, the wind from the south, perhaps the olive groves, and so on. And so when they're released somewhere, they sniff and say, aha, that is the wind from the north, therefore I have to fly south in order to go home. Others of us believe that perhaps it's the Earth's magnetic field that the pigeons are using, because it varies over the surface of the Earth, and if they were clever enough, perhaps they could make use of that variation in order to find home. And there's some evidence for that. Another group feels that it's low frequency sound. Pigeons are able to hear sounds below the range of human hearing, which is about 20 cycles per second. Pigeons are able to hear down to one tenth of one cycle per second. And the world is very noisy down at those low frequencies. And uh, uh, perhaps uh, that is what we're, they are using. Uh, but we still really don't know. And so as we watch the pigeons come home, uh, which should be here but isn't, uh, we see that what they are doing is totally mysterious. And uh, we don't know how they do it, but the pigeons seem to. So that's the story of bird uh, migration. It's an extraordinary phenomenon, and we are beginning to understand more and more about what they do, uh, but we still don't know all the answers. Thank you. Oh, very interesting. Uh, Dr. Walcott, that terrific information and wonderful illustrations. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, much appreciated. It's my pleasure. And uh, next time you have the chance, when you go out, take a look in the evening sometimes, and you, late evening, and you can see birds flying over. And uh, you can wonder or the butterflies, how they are doing it. Terrific. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.